Okay, welcome everyone to our final event for our One Book, One Community this uh, fall semester. Um, we've been doing this for approximately 21 years. The university used to support us, purchase books and things, but since COVID, they have dropped their community partnerships. So we're kind of out on our own. We thank East Bridgewater Public Library uh, for hosting Stephen Puglio last Saturday, and Ellen is a retired um, <laughs> library, director. library director in West Bridgewater who has taken over the reign of steering our ship. <laughs> um, pa Pam Hayes Bohannon, James's better half, uh, <laughs> takes care of the website through Bridgewater State University, and we thank her for that and thank both of you. And our One Book, One Community has already picked our spring read, which is Andy Weir's Project Hail Mary. It is not a Catholic book, we were asked that. <laughs> it is. However, be careful if you order it online, if I did buy the Catholic book. <laughs> <laughs> it is science fiction, and it does talk about a project in outer space. And we have some very exciting uh, programs lined up for that. And in the spring, we have, you'll never believe what happened to Lacey. We're actually going to uh, introduce that at Juneteenth, but we're going to have a panel on racism before that, um, and we'll have some book discussions. So we've never done a summer read, but we have, um, many people have asked if we could do one in the summer as well, and we want to get people before they're off on vacation. So June will be our highlight for that one. And we're also working on a book for next fall. So we, we're always ahead of where we are. <laughs> um, it's my pleasure this afternoon to introduce a friend and fellow colleague from Bridgewater State University, Professor James Hayes Bohannon, who's better known around the campus as the coffee guru. He knows more about coffee than you'll ever want to know. <laughs> he has done the program on coffee for senior college. He also, by request, did one on chocolate and tea for senior college, and now is doing one on migration. But today he's going to be talking about the potato, which is the theme of our, pro our book this fall and there are refreshments dealing with potatoes available for you whenever. Ms. <laughs> James, all yours. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, and I've, I've enjoyed, I've read most of these um, One Book, One Community books, and I really enjoyed reading the uh, Polio book, the second one that the committee has had from Stephen Polio, learned amazing amount. I, I knew that I would, um, because he's such a gifted historian, I hope you are all able to hear him last week, or, or if not, to have read his, his book. Um, and since it touched on a food, a commodity food, um, that's what I've kind of fallen into as a geographer at uh, Bridgewater. It's not what I was hired for. I was hired to be an environmental geographer and a geographer of Latin America. Um, but within my second year, I got kind of taken up with coffee uh, and have done a lot of a lot of stuff with coffee, which some of you know. So I call myself a coffee maven because I don't want to be the coffee expert. A maven is just a, a knowledgeable enthusiast. Um, and that's sort of my limit because I know coffee experts. Most of them grow coffee and I'm not that. And I thought that when this first came up, okay, I can become potato maven. Um, but there's a lot to potatoes. There's a lot to anything once you start looking. And so, uh, and also, 2020 is the year they kept giving, right? We kept like we kept thinking 2020 was over and things kept happening. So even after I agreed to do this, things kept happening that derailed my my potato learning. Um, so I'm at best a potato novitiate at this point, <laughs> just uh, starting out. Um, but I think I might have a few things to, uh, to share with you. So starting with hopefully that how to spell it. This is an alternate spelling. <laughs> it's, it's been circulating. You might have seen this online. This is, it's pronounced. It's, that's just potato. If the G H is 
from picked up in the OUGH is from dough and <laughs> so on. Yeah. So that's one of those. I've seen fish done this way, yeah. but uh, <laughs> this I just learned recently. That's I'm not going to try to say it the way it looks. But <laughs> it's just potato trusses. So, um, and just so that if whenever I give public presentations, I always uh, mention Doctor Doc Coffee. I think you need the dub 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 in front of it. Just to come back to anything I show today, if it looks like a link, it is a link. Um, even some things that don't look like links are links. A lot of the maps are links. Um, just if you want to follow up on anything that I show you today, you can just go to doctor.coffee. I created that just as a handy way to find all of my blogs, our shared blogs, websites, and things, because Bridgewa, you know, web host dot bridgewa slash jhazebo is really hard for people to remember but doctor dot coffee works as soon as i found out that dot coffee was a thing like dot com i jumped on it and to the doctor maven was already taken is that, is that maven dot coffee already out there beat me to it and it's a word most people don't know so i don't know who that is so that's what it looks like today um the next thing i Next time I give a public talk or something that I think everyone needs to know, this gets pushed down, but you can always get back to this talk through here. And it's, it's like a loop in here, right? So this article has a link back to these slides. So you go in there and never come out. Um, <laughs> about that plural, I, I throw the word geographies around a lot because, because I think that, so geography is about where things are, why they're there, why it matters. Um, and that can mean a lot of different things. The, the, the thing that we're asking the where question about could be a commodity. It could be the people who trade in that commodity. It could be knowledge about that, com that object. It can be lots of different things. So I think that geography, uh, being a geographer is what I did instead of deciding what to do when I grew up because it's both a physical science and a social science and an art. And a, so I never had to decide. And, this wheel of geography as it overlaps with other disciplines um, is kind of my excuse to delve into whatever strikes my fancy, like marine science, oh, that's marine geography, or medical science, that's medical geography, uh, and so on. So we are connected to a lot of other disciplines. So when we get messages like, oh, try to do some interdisciplinary work, it's like, that's all we do in geography. And I stole this uh, from the late, great Harm de Blay, uh, who was a friend and hero of our department. He's, he's the one in this picture that looks like a, like a professor guy. Uh, <laughs> he was the most prolific and, and brilliant geography professor ever to, to write in English. He was from South Africa, passed away on Cape Cod about 10 years ago, um, eight years ago. And this was when he visited our campus. Um, one of the times he visited our campus. You might have gotten to hear him. He gave one of our class of 42 lectures. Brilliant guy. I lifted this from his book. If you click here, you can find out more about him and more about his books and everything. Um, I often use a bridge as a metaphor for my teaching. This comes from a discussion I had once the first time I was going to Cape Verde. Um, I was really apprehensive about taking a group of students, including African students and African American students to Africa to learn about Africa. And I said, how can I be in charge of that? And I happened to meet a, a young woman from California who was an African American and an activist. And she said, you're not, you don't have to be the expert, you're the bridge. Mm -hmm. So, and I teach in Bridgewater. So, <laughs> so I try to find bridges that relate to what I'm talking about in some way. I put, I drop bridges into my syllabi sometimes and things like that, just to remind myself that I can't possibly uh, be the expert on things. Um, but I can maybe connect you to some knowledge. And uh, this bridge, this is one of my, my favorite bridge name. Does everybody, you know what this is, right? Bunker Hill. Yeah, the Leonard P. Zagum Bunker Hill Memorial Bridge. I love just saying that. That's, and it's going to come up later in the talk. There's actually a potato connection to this particular bridge that you'll see. Um, just something that came up when um, Stephen Polio was talking the other day. Somebody asked him, who are your favorite historians? And he mentioned um, this author, which is 
fuzzy on it. Where's her name? Mill. Oh, yeah, Candace. Candace, thank you, Millard. Oh, I think Candace, Candace Millard. I, I forgot her name, yeah. but I remembered the book, <laughs> River of Doubt. This book is amazing. If you are, uh, he mentioned it, you know, but I this of the several books he mentioned, this is the only one I've actually read, and it was in my mind because he told that story. If you heard him last week, he told that story about Teddy Roosevelt and getting shot in the. That came from this book. Oh, I was yeah. like, he got that from this book. And this book is about Teddy Roosevelt after he was president, somehow talked the Secret Service into letting, letting him go explore the Amazon. Uh, <laughs> and it was a really stupid idea. <laughs> and he barely survived it. But where he did all of this is called the River of Doubt was the informal name they gave to it. And it is kind of the next river over from my river in the Amazon where I did my dissertation. So I did mine under much more comfortable conditions uh, uh -huh. than he did. Um, okay, so one potato geography is just where does it come from, right? Uh, it does not come from Ireland. It does not come from Europe. Um, and and um, I think if you read the book, he, he talks about this. It comes from the Andes. Um, <clears throat> and this is one of those things like cacao, if you ask where did it come from, you can get a lot of different answers because it's been in certain places for longer than anybody can remember. Um, so you can certainly get people in Peru who are convinced it came from Peru, or Bolivia who are convinced it came from Bolivia, and so on. And uh, of course, none of these were distinctions at the time that potato emerged. Um, and this map is from a journal article uh, in um, American Journal of Botany. I have the citation here. There's a link here if you have a Bridgewater account, this should take you in through the library to the whole article. Um, and if not, you can use the citation to find it. But um, what I think is interesting here is they are identifying the origin of, of the potato in the same way that a lot of botany has done, the way that Linnaeus mistakenly identified the origins of coffee at the time, Linnaeus in the 1700s was figuring out where coffee, you know, what to call coffee. He had coffea, which comes from the, the Arabic word, which comes from um, a, a word in, in Ethiopia. It's from the Abyssinian word, coffea. He had the genus, and for the species, he's like, where did it come from? So he looks at like all the coffee examples he can find, and he says, ah, Arabica, because mm. that's where it all was. Mm -hmm. He just... It's from Ethiopia. <laughs> it should be called Ethiopica, but he didn't know. <laughs> so these folks, you know, with the uh, 250 years later, it's a little easier to get some definitive information. And this is numbers of species um, give them uh, a pretty good idea of where this genus of potato actually comes from. And it does seem to be Bolivia and or Peru. Way up high. Places that are <clears throat> cold and difficult to grow anything. Mm -hmm. And that's really, I think, unlike a lot of other crops that I've been interested in, the thing that makes the potato so important is that it is very tolerant of, of just bad conditions that, would, that other plants just can't mm -hmm. tolerate. Um, and also, it has benefited, if potato can benefit, it has benefited from human ingenuity and just people figuring out how to make the most of it. So this is uh, Machu Picchu. Uh, there's the really postcard parts of Machu Picchu. And then if you're up, up there, you can wander around a little bit and just look for the, the yamas and so forth. And this is uh, kind of highlighting the fact that Machu Picchu is not a temple or anything. It's a working landscape. And uh, the, the ability to terrace land to slow down the flow of water and create little microclimates where there's level land that you can plant potatoes or other high altitude crops in is what makes this area 12 and 13,000 feet up uh, amenable to potato. There's no potatoes on the tour, but <laughs> there's, uh, I mean, it has, this is the more like, there's all this geometry to Machu Picchu, but just being in this region, um, we went for Pam's birthday a few years ago, and uh, I was just struck by how many places there is just remarkably 
effective um, terracing and just level walls built in the most un unexpected places. And even the railroad tracks being set on handmade walls that mm. here, you know, you might do it as an ornamental thing in front of your house for $10,000 or something. They had just these perfectly straight walls. And it's about managing soil and water in microclimates. Um, and depending upon the angle, you can see yeah, a lot of fields there. That's, that's all, these are all from Machu Picchu. I didn't know I'd be giving a potato talk while we were in Machu Picchu. I might have tried to visit some other places. But one thing I learned up there um, is about, uh, or, or saw some examples of, is, is the importance of, of biodiversity within agriculture of varietals within agriculture. And in this area, even though this is not the origin zone for corn, corn originates either in Oaxaca or Puebla, Mexico, ask people in Oaxaca and Puebla, and they'll, they'll argue it out for you. Uh, Oaxaca and Puebla, Mexico is where corn or originates at about one mile altitude. We're here at two and a half miles altitude and there's corn growing and it's all different colors, right? It's blue and orange and yellow and white and all these things in red. And I noticed this in the back of a little convenience store in a place where they were selling bottled water um, and a lot of sugary soft drinks, which is really reducing, you know, it's, it's really reducing all that to corn syrup. But there is still in this location, at least for now, that, that variety that makes the corn and the potatoes and a lot of other crops more resilient, less susceptible. Speak up just a little bit. Oh, okay, sure. Thanks. Um, another, this has really nothing to do with potatoes except for kind of a similar location and this is kind of pushing out potato. This is quinoa and, you know, quinoa is a grain that has all these health benefits. It's also, um, an incredibly important cash crop in Highland, Peru, and it is uh, any of us who are buying quinoa in a grocery store are paying more for it than local people can pay for it. And it's being irrigated of all things, like with modern irrigation systems. So one of the local people we were talking to there, um, an American guy who lives in the area was saying, this is the quinoa market here is very good for those who can tap into it, but it's becoming a bit of a problem for other Highland uh, Highland people. Okay, back to the potato. Where is it uh, grown? <laughs> These are millions of tons. This is by country. This is you know a graduated circle map. Who grows potatoes? What countries does it grow in? 150 countries grow potatoes. That's pretty amazing okay it's a very uh, tolerant crop of a lot of different conditions you know most of these countries don't have 10 or 12 thousand foot elevations if it can grow up there it can also grow lower that's not the opposite is of course not not often true in the biggest uh, producers we produce a lot here in the United States and we'll talk a little bit about where some of that uh, goes we're one of the biggest producers but so are uh, China, India, Russia, Ukraine, a lot of Northern European countries. So this is by total volume, you know, even some African countries with very little highland elevation and certainly not much cold can also grow them. So it can grow over a wide range of conditions. This is a core plus map, you know, showing the, the production per kilograms per eight hectare, which is pretty close to pounds per acre. Um, you can see we're really not growing it in much of the United States and, and we're not growing much compared to Northern Europe and certain parts of India and China. Uh, pretty remarkable. And the origin zone, you know, you might even miss that, right? In terms of the importance of it by tons, right? Not culturally, but by tons. Um, how we got from over here to all over, there's an article now been out um, since 2011, uh, how the potato changed the world. 
uh, in Smithsonian Magazine, November 2011, uh, How the Potato Changed the World, brought to Europe from the New World by Spanish explorers, the lowly potato, he puts in the subtitle, mm -hmm. gave rise to modern industrial agriculture. Oh. So he, um, he describes how it goes from a very local thing to a global, a global phenomenon. Uh, and I love the, the variety that he captures there. Much better photo than my corn through the, uh, through the shop. But coming, arriving in uh, Spain did not make it a European sensation right away. Um, people were suspicious of it even. They, they thought it, they associated it with leprosy because it was so wrinkly. Yeah. And, you know, we had a lot of, like, associations with, like, just how things look or sound or smell makes us, you know, that science was not what it is now. And so uh, I went looking. This really, uh, when I read that, I thought I should get a potato that, sh a picture that shows how wrinkly potatoes are as an example. That proved difficult. <laughs> if you Google, and I just lazily Google image search like I do everything, I Google image search, try finding a lumpy potato and <laughs> nobody takes pictures of lumpy potatoes anymore. <laughs> They're all perfect. Yeah. Oh, that's a little scary how perfect they are, right? Just like all the ears of corn look alike and you know, all, the, all the, the, the bell peppers are the same color green. You know, it's a little, we, the 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 rich genetic diversity this is the, has been for me the the sort of paradox of agriculture is that the rich genetic diversity of wild plants whether they're corn or potatoes or or coffee gives us the ability to tailor our agriculture to the traits we need or want like smoothness flavor shelf life or whatever and so we have incredibly uniform looking potatoes. They, and so I found this heirloom variety, the Chiquilla Pitiquinha, that has kind of a lumpy looking thing. You know what? You let, you know, the poor potato sit on your table, it does get wrinkly when it's really old. Oh, yes. Yeah, I could, I could picture them. And I guess I could have like sure. made it happen. Sure. You know, the eyes yeah. come out and it, it does get wrinkly. Yes. But Instagram is just like <laughs> pushing those aside, right? And by the way, where I learned about this leprosy connection and several of the things in the next few slides are from this book. Try finding a book on potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> what you find on potatoes are recipe books, right? They're, it's very versatile, as you know, right? It's so versatile that it's easy to find books about how to cook with potatoes. But like, what is the story of the potato? This book, just called Potato, A History of the Propitious Esculent. <laughs> Propitious meaning kind of lucky. Esculent meaning like anything you can eat is an esculent, apparently. I had to look up both of those words. The History of the Propitious Esculent. Um, he has a nice smooth potato on the cover of this thing. And, and I have to admit, this is like early in this process, I was going to delve in and just give you all lots of stuff from this book. I'm going to give you a little bit of stuff from this book. There's so much here that I could not get to it all. Back to this, there was the suspicion. So the potato got from the Andes to Spain, but the rest of Europe was really reluctant. Um, one conduit is this guy, uh, Antoine Parmentier. Uh, he was painted here by Francois Dumont later in his life. Earlier in his life, in the mid 1700s, um, potatoes were not known in France. Potato, you know, they were they were known of, but they did not have them in France. Um, they did not have them in England. Uh, like I said, they were afraid of them. The Germans had already adopted them somehow, at least to some degree. And as a POW in Prussia, he got nothing but potatoes <laughs> for like three years. Um, and I don't think he had the variety, like the recipe book we're talking about. I think it was just like, here's your potatoes. 
here's your potatoes, right? Um, he had all these potatoes, like, oh, they're not as bad as I thought they'd be. For POW food, they're not so bad. And he ended up writing a book. He wrote a series of books about potatoes, like telling the French, like, you gotta have these potatoes, they're great. And they're, um, this is the kind of irony compared to the main story you've been reading, is that this is rescue from famine. Mm -hmm. France had had famine because of their reliance on grain. And he said, the potato can do okay at times when the grain is not doing okay, it'll see you through. Have some potatoes. And so, you know, they do. Um, which this is, I think, chapter seven in that book touches on that. And I, I just think it's, it's fascinating. And not only is the potato good, you know, food, it's nifty looking too, like the flower. So this is um, Louis XIV and Marie Antoinette wearing flower, the potato flower as like in, on their lapels and in their hats and things like this. He, he makes it, so he goes from like POW to P.T. Barnum in terms of like, <laughs> hey, you, not only are you going to love it, you're going to love it. You're going to look so stylish, you know, all that. So I, I just think that's kind of, sometimes I find stories like, is that, did that really happen? Like they're making this up, but I trust the historians, so. Turbell, Switzerland is this charming little village way up way up, um, well, it's over here in the Alps. I don't have the exact elevation, but really high up, like 10,000 feet or something. It's a very high elevation place. It's, they got townies, right? <laughs> they are a townie place. They've had, in, in 1340, they have a list of the 14 families who lived there. In 2008, when this, uh, when this author went and talked to the guy, there were 13 families. They were 13 of the same 14 families. Wow. One family kind of died out over the last 700 <laughs> years, but all 13 of those other families are there. So these are the same people occupying the same land successfully for 700 years. No migrating in or out. They were like, oh, we got to give up and go farm someplace else. This is amazing, right? And it happens because they have figured out how to do their farming in a way that is sustainable. When we talk about sustainability, 700 years of growing the same food with the same people in the same place and not having to move, that's pretty amazing. What's their diet? Potatoes and cheese. Potatoes and cheese. They've been doing that forever. Except they haven't. They think they've been doing that forever. This is the perfect food but they've only been doing it since 1750. Now, only since 1750 is, uh, you know, that's kind of a long time, but they, they were somehow surviving 400 years before that, before anybody brought them a potato. So this is pretty interesting, I think. It's, it doesn't, it is a new world, so-called new world food, even if it's become deeply ingrained it's an old, it has become part of their food ways, part of something that they think they've always done. You know, we, Pam and I, I just, I don't have a slide for this because it just popped into my head. Um, oh, Pam, I'm sorry. This is one of those trips where I got to go someplace mm -hmm. and I really was sad that Pam didn't. I got to go to this village called Yanqui Talpan between Puebla and Mexico City, up high on a volcano. I got to spend just one or two nights there while Pam was in Puebla. I went up in this village and these uh, people, they speak Nahuatl, they're Aztecs, and they have all of the food and uh, crops, uh, you know, everything that they do up there, they think of themselves having done for millennia. But they never lived up there until the Spanish came and pushed them up there. So it, I guess it takes a couple of centuries for something to become deeply ingrained. The potato has definitely become deeply ingrained in this highland area because it works really well at highlands. Okay, so here's another geography. It's like, what, what's this thing about comparative advantage with elevation? So this is something I, 
I uh, use a lot in teaching about coffee or, or tropical agriculture. Generally, I probably also stole this from Dr. DeBlay. It's kind of a standard textbook thing. In the tropics, we have crops that are prevalent at different elevations. You know, bananas and sugar cane. You can find all of these within a short distance, say in Nicaragua or Guatemala or Mexico. You could find places where all of this exists as you go up a mountain, right? Um, coffee right here. And it varies a little bit with latitude, but you have these elevations. So you have uh, grazing and potatoes way up high. You have corn and small grains below that. Uh, and that these are the elevations that would, where that would happen in the tropics. Um, and it's pretty, it's pretty uniform across, around the equator because temperatures don't vary much during the year. Um, so if you're at a given elevation, you're gonna have a pretty consistent temperature profile. But in the rest of the world, the circulation of the atmosphere is pretty flexible, let's say, or variable. Um, and especially in places like Northern Europe, we have weather patterns that are really influenced by the circulation of the atmosphere. Um, that's the short version of this slide. The, it can vary a lot by season and you can have wet seasons, wet years, dry years, make a tremendous difference. In this part of Switzerland, oh, I did find the elevation. The Torbell is just at one mile up. Below that, below the village, they can grow wheat and oats, barley and rye. All of that stops at about 3,500 feet elevation. And all of this is susceptible to short-term fluctuations in the weather. The potato is high, dry, cold, and more um, tolerant of a variety from year to year. So the potato growing up near the village had be, became prevalent um, during years when rye failed. Again, 250 years ago or more, long enough ago they think they've always done this. How they held on with just the rye before that is, you know, a little dicier, I guess. Shakespeare actually cites potatoes. Um, The Merry Wives of Windsor and Troilus and Cressida. These are two Shakespeare plays I've not read, which puts them along like 30 <laughs> Shakespeare plays I've not read. <laughs> There's like, I've read the same ones everyone's read, right? Like Romeo and Juliet. So quote, he, he quotes potatoes, or he mentions potatoes twice, but there's a lot, this will link you to all these articles where people argue about what kind of potato is he talking about? Yellow potatoes, sweet potatoes, not white potatoes. He was before, he was writing and living before the potato, the genus we're talking about, before it arrived in Europe at all, um, and certainly before it had arrived in England. Um, and at that time, they relied on grains, and the grain, the, the district where he was writing, life was, what did they say? something brutish and short. It was very difficult. This is where Shakespeare, where and when, in the time of Shakespeare and the place of Shakespeare, only 70% of infants lived to age one. Mm -hmm. Only 48% lived to age five. And if you lived to 15, you were in the top 27%. Mm -hmm. So the real, you know, Grain worked sometimes, but not enough. And this is the effect on children, the effect on um, nursing mothers was in, in just on pregnant mothers was even more severe. So dying in childbirth was way too common. And then once they were um, born, having the, the children live on was, was very difficult. And, and again, reading here in the, in the potato book, um, 
one of the things it mentioned is the importance of potatoes. When potatoes later come in after Shakespeare, what they're doing is making this grain economy more sustainable because the grain economy included hay and and they're describing in Shakespeare's day this is not Shakespeare this is Romania this is where Pam and I went uh, with a church group in 2004 to Dishvalva uh, Romania they still stack hay by hand in Dishvalva they did not really want to it's a lot of work to stack grain by hand or to stack hay by hand. And in the time of uh, Shakespeare, in a lot of parts of Europe, it was not only difficult, but um, lethally so. That the, the people were in this system where they had to stack hay in order to keep their animals going through the winter, making shape hay while the sun shines and putting it up for the winter uh, at the end of the day, the cows come home. We actually got to see that in Romania too. The cows come home and they eat the grain, the, the hay that you put aside for them. They're doing this work before any of the grain they can eat comes in. Mm. They're at the end, they've, in July, when they're doing most of this haying, they are kind of running on fumes in a lot of agricultural communities in Europe. They have not very much of the small grains like rye or barley or wheat left they're working as hard as they can to have grass for their animals to get them through the winter part and they have very little for that gap so july and august are you know beautiful time of year but a really deadly time of year and the potato helps to fill that gap um, and so but again, not until the mid 1700s. So this was when Pam and I in our church group from First Parish here in Bridgewater went, we got to go to a uh, community. This is kind of the next town over from Dishvalva Harangalab, where we had our partnership. This is a link to all the photos that, that I produced from that. You know, they have, they're growing food, they have, have hay for their animals, um, but they're also cooking with a lot of, a mix of grain, potatoes, and guess what? The potatoes were delicious because the potatoes <laughs> went from like here to here. <laughs> They're all organic. They're all free range potatoes. And they it's like, I never knew what a potato tasted like before because the potatoes that we <laughs> typically have at home, who knows how long they've been in a bag or a shelf or a closet That's before right. they get to us, right? Mm -hmm. For the most part. We do occasionally we get certain times of the year here we can get the local potatoes and it's a treat. But I think the first time I ever had a potato and thought, wow, this has a flavor was when we were visiting these folks in Romania. Okay. <laughs> I put that this lecture is brought to you in part by Cape Cod potato chips, not realizing uh, that Evie was making potatoes had made potato chip cookies for us, but also Those because, oh, you did, oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, would, I would have guessed they had to be, right? But I also had some, you know, reading the book and eating the potato chips and making the, the slides all at once. So, so I started thinking like, how many potato chips do we eat in this country? A lot is the answer. Who was that guy, Gerald R. Ford? Gerald R. Ford, um, they they named a they, they uh, christened a uh, aircraft carrier named the Gerald R. Ford, and I don't I guess I think nautical too much. The Gerald R. Ford aircraft carrier it's basically our biggest ship. If you took nine of those, that's our annual consumption of potato chips in this country. You could sink nine aircraft carriers with our potato chips. <laughs> and a potato chip weighs one fourth of what the potatoes weighed. So a lot is the correct answer. <laughs> um, isn't that crazy? Because uh, any number like above 12, we need some analogy, right? If I give students a size of a place, I try to find the size of some other place. 
to put next to it or something like that. So yeah, in our, our potato chip habit can be measured in aircraft carriers. And that's the biggest aircraft carrier that we have. I went to Wikipedia. Okay. Topping. Oh, I don't have the units on here, but these are like times a million tons. This is this is embarrassing. I don't have the actual uh, number, but this this is the rank, the relative rankings. USA is number five in potato production within the U.S. states. Idaho, you know, Massachusetts doesn't even make the top ten, um, which maybe is not a surprise. Actually, Maine is the only New England state that makes the top 10. Um, a lot of states producing a lot more, of course, including Idaho. Um, and I'm, I don't think this is tons. I think this is like 1,000 tons or something. It's a, it's a crazy number. I will. This is one of those things also, one reason I put things online is I can go back and correct it. Because like, this is... You, you get a you get a scornful look at least in my class when you do this like throwing numbers around with no units that's not something I usually do sorry about that okay so their variety they have a lot of options a lot of things you can do with potato hash browns French fries chips vodka the other vegetables are not even trying right <laughs> when life gives you potato make Vodka. Lots of dad jokes about vodka and potatoes. So I st and then you can go here and you can just find like endless memes about vodka and potatoes. Guess what? There's something missing here. This is what vodka is made from. Basically anything. Corn, sorghum, rice, rye, soy, grapes, molasses, Sugar beets and wheat are all used for commercial vodka. Potato vodka, it turns out, is not that big a part of the market. It's, but like, if you ask me two weeks ago, what goes into vodka? It's like potatoes, right? It's all potatoes. Yeah, that's just, it's like a niche within vodka is potatoes. Because, and if, again, they've been making vodka for centuries, and the people who've been doing that didn't have potatoes until the last two centuries. So they found other things to distill. <laughs> Not just food. Petroleum and wood pulp byproducts can be used to make vodka. Now, I was always told, like, I remember middle school science class, like, don't even think about the alcohol you're making from wood chips in chemistry class. Did you ever have that? lecture so i don't think it's direct but the you know the references i saw said like byproducts of i don't know there is though potato vodka it's a whole thing you can go get this book vodka potato vodka comprehensive study by application residential restaurants bars clubs hotels and others 70 to 80 proof sales channels players and region global market outlook but I didn't buy the book because the book with this potato vodka geography information is $3,500. So that's a lot more than I'm getting paid for this talk. So, um, okay. So we can't talk about potatoes very long in the Hayesville Hannon House without referring to the summer of 1993 when two, uh, young folks from Tucson are out driving about the country and we see this sign free taters for out-of-staters <laughs> this is described on Pam's uh, one of our first family blogs maybe one of our first blogs at all was celebrating the states where Pam decided her year of project was going to be every every uh, anniversary of a state's admission to the Union she would read a book watch a movie and make a food related to that state. In some days that meant like four states became states on the same day. We got very busy around our house. I participated in a lot of that. Um, and this led to some of our later blogging efforts, but she, she includes this in the Idaho. So Idaho is the top producer in the United States and um, just on the highway rest area, what you need to get the potato 
is you need a driver's license that's not from Idaho. They actually check. <laughs> like, none of you locals are getting these potatoes. Um, and they are cooked perfectly. They tell you, this is the only way. You wrap it in foil, you do it at this temperature for this time. And it was really delicious. And, you know, that was lunch. <laughs> also on that blog, um, there is an Idaho. We got this little brochure. <laughs> from the Idaho tourism people and it had several potato recipes and one of them is on our blog back before we got just a recipe family blog we have the state family blog with recipes and it tells you how to do it and, and yeah there's just this ridiculously big potato <laughs> out front not the only one in this country uh, by the way it's um, there it is in front of the museum. This is from Gastro Obscura. If you know Atlas Obscura, they've got this spinoff called Gastro Obscura with lots of food related places around the world, including just a ton of potato sites. Um, this is a pretty uh, recent article that shows top 10 potato spot places around the world that you can visit. Um, and it includes that potato museum in Idaho. Um, it does not include the potato museum in New Brunswick, which is here, Potato World. We were up visiting Bridgewater, Maine, because we do have this Bridgewater's project where we visit every Bridgewater we can. If you zoom in here, we are real suckers for these kind of face and cut out things. So this is our uh, the three of us. Uh, in, oh, I see with our potato portrait. Um, it does include Parque de la Papa in Chahuayetire, Peru, which we did not visit when we were in the area, but this is up in the general area of Cusco. And what I like about just this entry about the park is it's showing the importance of indigenous knowledge. Species biodiversity is diminishing quickly around the world. Varietals within a species of an agricultural product are diminishing around the world. But the ind indigenous knowledge of all of that is disappearing even faster because people um, either are uh, extirpated or at a minimum removed from their traditions in a lot of cases. And so our knowledge of varieties like this is rapidly disappearing. So having a museum that that features not only all of these varieties of potatoes, but people who still understand them is, is really important. Um, that does also, um, it does include the Potato Shed Memorial in Charlestown, right under the location of the Leonard P. Zakem Bunker Hill Memorial Bridge. Mm -hmm is a place that used to have potato sheds, just where potatoes were brought, stored, and sold um, from about 1850 to 1960. And then they were all destroyed. On a river? Right along a little tributary of the Charles. And there's a little tiny park there where they have memorialized this in bronze, the potato sheds. None of the sheds are there haven't been there in a long time. Did you know about that place before you started this research? No. <laughs> no, I've, I've not been to that part of Boston uh, at all since since this. And so that's on the at, at, I learned about it from um, Atlas Gastro Obscura. Um, and I'm almost uh, done here. Just Nueva Receta. That's our our food blog, Nueva Receta, new recipe, something Pam started, uh, but we both participate in. We try to average a new recipe every week. We've kind of fallen off, but some weeks we have two. We're still above the mean. Uh, a new recipe every week, something new we try, cook, and write about. Um, and it had, this is a link to the best latkes ever. Just my humble opinion, uh, but we really do latkes very well since we found this recipe here's the secret oh. an apple so it's onion potato oh, and then potato. apple for that just does wonders for the texture and um 
And then of course applesauce on it and every applesauce, honey, sour cream, the usual thing. But we, uh, for years have had a big Hanukkah dinner with friends and even, you know, friends who grew up having latkes that, in their Jewish households at home said, you're doing this better than my mother. <laughs> Don't go. Um, so you didn't bring any with you. And I didn't. It's, it doesn't travel well. <laughs> but we've also learned you don't have to wait to Hanukkah for it. We have them <laughs> whenever we want. Whenever we want. <laughs> and you know, and this is a thing about <clears throat> how we've sort of evolved as foodies. When we were living in Texas, which was our last stop before we moved here, there was this little um, health food store. I put that in quotes because like, what makes it healthy? Just the things were odd, you know? Like, because they had latke mix. Uh -huh. <laughs> which is not very good. <laughs> but we were like, oh, let's have the fancy latke mix. This is, um, this is not a potato, but it is a, a plant the, the, um, that behaves like a potato. And if you go to drpotatohead.blogspot.com, it's a separate blog I started when I thought I was gonna be diving a lot deeper into this. I put a few things there about different potatoes and potato related um, items. This is something called elephant ear. And I got started thinking about this because a friend dropped off, he thought I needed a plant. So he dropped off a plant. I thought, this looks familiar. It's called, in Nicaragua, we, uh, it grows really, really big. Um, <clears throat> I don't wanna click that because it'll take me in the rabbit hole. Uh, this is a plant, it's on the tip of my tongue. Philodendra? No. It's, if you get Terra chips, mm -hmm. they have all those different... Yucca? It's, a it's, it's similar to yucca. It, oh, it is, it's taro. Taro. It's taro. I was trying to think, there's another name for it that, and this is one of those things, like certain roots, like taro. So I've heard of taro. And then I heard about a totally different name that my friends in Nicaragua use, like, oh, it's the same mm -hmm. thing. And then um, the same with manioc, tapioca, mm -hmm. cassava. Jerusalem artichoke also is a peru. Yes, Jerusalem artichoke is, um, I haven't been able to figure out how to cook with that very well. This is a much milder, malanga. So it's like, oh, that's not, that's not taro, it's malanga. Oh, guess what, that's the same thing. It behaves a lot like the potato, but it's much, it's low elevation, very wet really uses a lot of water. Um, we have one on our back porch and they're just, they're just fun, um, but also very important. And I've had them, when in Nicaragua, I've had them mainly in something that you would think is a potato soup. Or like I said, the terra chips, it's like a potato chip. It's like the white one with a little purple flex in it. No relation to the actual potato. Um, and again, everything I've shown you is, all through Dr. Dot Coffee, and that's all I got. <laughs> and I hope if there are questions, I will do my best. Yes. Yeah. What is it about altitude? I'm not a, a scientist in any sense, but you keep mentioning altitude about potatoes. But then we have them grown in Ireland. I mean, what yeah. this whole thing is about, which I don't think there's a whole lot of altitude. <laughs> no. Right. Yeah. So yeah. it's. So I guess the thing, I mean, at high altitude, we tend to have thin soils, short growing season, um, Colder temp cold temperatures, dry air. And so something that can survive all of that, when you move it down to uh, wetter conditions can grow better, but it's, but it is, it's, it's really propitious. It's really lucky in a way that this works because you're also, as we know from the Irish story, we're also bringing it down into the range of lots of to, diseases and things. things. Yeah. yeah. But it just seems like a, a little bit of a, um, you know, a non sequitur. I mean, yeah, yeah, a, yeah, it's a, a real paradox. That they should grow there. Right, because a lot of our food thing, of food crops, we think of a more narrow climate range. And this is what, in potatoes, they started in this very harsh environment. And we're, we're all, yeah. those of us who like potatoes are fortunate that they can tolerate so many if you can protect them from the pests. Yeah. Well, that's kind of my question was, you, you talked about ge geography where the potato was around the globe. Uh -huh. And 
I don't know the the famine. Uh, I mean the the blight in the potatoes in in Ireland. Um, I I didn't realize it also affected in Scotland. But at that time, was there a global? Uh, was it related to the the um, the weather conditions there, the the moisture and the, all that? I think that? my understanding is that it was that it was localized in yeah. in those two. Kind of, well, two what I understood was that uh, it actually did affect like the potatoes and the Andes, but because there were so many other varieties mm -hmm. there, you know, the the blight it didn't wipe them all out. It, it, it you know it only wiped out that one type, so the other ones were fine. And so people in you know in South America didn't experience the famine. So my other question was related to yams, and I know yams have always been a a, a, pro, a, a crop in in Africa, mm -hmm. and you know there are, have been a lot of famines in Africa, and there all have has been you know you know difficulty with crops and and things in that climate. So if this, is this a very good um, crop in Africa? It looks like it's pretty minor. Is it, is it yeah. yams or, or sweet potatoes? Are they say this is all potato? Well, yams and sweet potatoes are different. In, oh, okay. Yeah. Are they, they're totally different. Right. Okay. Yeah, they're okay. different. <laughs>